Get ready to learn a lot about how DNA has helped solve crime, because today we're going to be talking about investigative genetic genealogy. I think you know it, but you really don't know. We say mama's baby, papa's maybe. It's like a puzzle that you get addicted to solving. 100% match, it's the same person. Oh no! I don't notify people about that, but... <laughs> <laughs> Those holiday DNA tests, probably a lot of people get like a not too fun surprise when they take that test. Maybe we should just start with kind of an understanding of the terminology itself. Uh, I know forensic genetic genealogy, investigative genetic genealogy. Could you just like break down what it is that we're even discussing today? Sure. So those two terms are pretty much interchangeable, forensic genetic genealogy and investigative genetic genealogy. And what it means is using genetic genealogy. And I know that that term sounds really redundant because we're already like saying the genetic yeah. and now we're saying genealogy. But traditional genealogy means using a paper trail to trace your ancestors. Whereas genetic genealogy means using DNA to apply you know, further learning to um, the genealogy process. So your genealogy and your genetic genealogy might be a little bit different because what if you don't really know who your birth father is? Oh, so gotcha. then your you paper you know trail it, is going to be You really different. don't know. Right. And a lot of people don't know. <laughs> One thing I've learned. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> That'll be fun to they dive into. They think they know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I think, mean, but I they don't. think I know who my parents are, but who knows? Have you taken a DNA test? How far back? No. I mean, actually, yeah, actually, we have taken a DNA <laughs> oh, test. Yeah. But I'll I didn't see them on the list, so who knows? <laughs> I'm sure I'm sure that comes up all the time. Can we open up your DNA profile right now? I'm just kidding. We, won't. we could. <laughs> we could, yeah. Actually, Matt, you should bring, if you're logged into yours, I you should am. bring yours up. So he so Matt has uh and this probably doesn't matter to you, but he has a natural wet earwax type. Do you know that they can tell that from the DNA? No. Yeah, and um I think I think there's a few funny things. So when I'm on something like 23andMe, it matches me to cousins occasionally. Is that essentially what you're doing, or what's the difference between kind of what your workflow looks like versus what that social network kind of is? It, it looks pretty similar because we do start with a list of DNA matches. So there's a couple of things that I look at in the beginning of a case that I'm working on. One of the things I look at is the admixture or heritage. And that's the same thing that you see on 23andMe or Ancestry where it says you're 23% Native American and 80% Irish and, you know, that wouldn't add up, but uh, <laughs> you know, it gives you the, it gives yeah, you the numbers. Yeah, I gotcha. I'm 5% Neanderthal, <laughs> throw that in there. Yeah. So we've got Matt's right here, and it has a couple of different regions. We've got some, um, and Matt actually shared with me that he's Filipino, and this makes sense oh, because yeah. um, you have some Iberian Peninsula there, and oh, who yeah. went to the Philippines? It was Spain. So mm -hmm. it would make sense to have Iberian Peninsula there because they colonized the Philippines. So, oh, um, uh, yeah. But it's interesting. <laughs> like, there's so many different regions here. Like, my, mine only says... Uh, Irish and British, like mine is all British Isles, almost a hundred percent. And so you have so many different regions and that's really, really so cool. So his ancestors Thank were you. more adventurous. Yes, They absolutely. were more, like, they around. traveled more like, what is and they going met on? people from so further many away. Regions. Yeah. And then what is this, the V, like what's, what's the top one? What is this? Uh, Bisaya, that's the Philippines. That's oh, the Philippines. okay. Yeah. Very well, cool. 50% Filipino, 20% Chinese, uh, Northern Philippines, Spain, German. A little bit of Germany and those, <laughs> those little micro regions, I don't pay a whole lot. I don't, I don't give a lot of weight to those uh, if it's under 3%. So, right. is but the because, Basque is, is like Spanish too. So is it because exactly. everybody has a little bit of, un, that's 1% of it's everything like, we're all. It's like ancient migrations. Yeah. So like I, if you really looked at my original breakdown, it had me as um, like 8% um, Pakistan. And, mm. you know, that's not going to be traceable ever if I went back a long, long time in my genealogy, yeah. I wouldn't be able to find that. Um, now they've updated the, they, they update these every so often because they have new information about where people are from. And um, so now mine really just says British Isles <laughs> and Ireland. It's, oh. it's very, um, uh, so it, it does change over time as they get new science, but a lot of the micro regions are really like ancient migration. So um, it's not necessarily a, an influence of like a recent ancestor at all. So to what percent do you, kind of contribute your work to. So would 50% Filipino be significant? What about 20% Chinese? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so one thing that I work on, I work on a lot of Hispanic cases. And um, one thing that I'm always looking at with those is the percent of 
um, Native American, and that comes out as American Indian on our on our on our measurement tool that we use. And so, um, what that tells me with a Hispanic case, and it's not a hundred percent accurate, but um, a person that is Hispanic from Mexico and has a very low percentage of uh, Native American DNA. Um, this person is more likely to be from a city because the cities were colonized with more European people. Whereas a person with very high Native American percentage, um, like, you know, in the 70 percent region, uh, that person might have come from a more rural area of Mexico. Um, and so that that gives us some more information than what we would have um, in like a European case where a lot of people just have general, you know, European admixture and it's a lot of different European regions. Um, in those cases of my of the Hispanic cases that we work on, it does give a little bit more information about where the person might have Oh, I never gone. thought about it. So just it's from subtracting information, so if you yeah. get uh, a tooth or something and it has DNA and it's from somewhere just simply smaller, you just have a much easier time tracking that person down. Right. And then the other part that we have is a list of DNA matches. So... That's the other thing that we're looking at at first. And just like you described with 23andMe, uh, you have the list of DNA matches and where they're from is going to tell you where this John or Jane Doe is from. So if you have a lot of high DNA matches that are all from the same area, um, and again, I'm just gonna throw it back to my Hispanic cases from Mexico, that tells us a lot about where that person has come from. So I've worked cases um, with, uh, a Jane Doe from the Mexican state of Aguas Calientes, and mm. she has a lot of DNA matches, and they're all from Aguas Calientes. I just started a new one, and I'm just looking at where her DNA matches come from, and I've noticed a few of them are from the Mexican state of Puebla, so that tells me that maybe she came from Puebla. But we do have to be careful because it's possible that there might also be an underrepresented population. So they might have a lot of high matches all from one area, but then what you're not seeing are the matches that are not well represented. So if I were, you know, half German, then all of my German matches are not gonna show up because my German cousins have not been in the DNA database. Um, so we can't always just look at the top matches. We right. have to look at all right. the matches. You have to kind of overlay what the actual population looks like and then what's in the database and then yep. what you're getting and then kind the of matches. taking a sort of a Venn diagram type thing of what's actually on both. Absolutely. And we've been we've been fooled before because uh, there was one case that I worked on of a John Doe that was um, half Hispanic from New Mexico and half Peruvian. And the whole time we were working the case as if he's like 100% New Mexican because all the DNA matches were from New Mexico. But then when we had a candidate for um, this doe, we were like, wait a second, this person is half Peruvian. And then um, eventually I went through all the DNA matches and I found out that they were all from one side of the family. So his uh, father's side that was Peruvian, there was nobody in his all of his DNA matches that was uh, that matched the father's side. So um, that was really interesting because only one side of the family was represented. Karen, it's so great meeting you. I was wondering how you got into forensic genetic genealogy. Well, that is a fun story. Um, there's really two areas of my life that kind of came together. And I should point out that my, I have a day job. My day job is as a nurse educator. Um, I'm a registered nurse by trade. I have, um, I've done ICU work and now I'm working in nurse education. But I've always had a couple of little side passions. So just like Batman, a day job and then secret yeah. crime I mean, solver. What at does night. Batman do during the day? Just a billionaire. Oh, okay. Right, right, right. It's similar. Similar. To <laughs> it's you very similar. Job. Very. It's almost exactly the same. <laughs> Different I mean. day job, but it's still a day job. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so on the side, I've always had an interest. My mom is adopted, and so since I was very young, I always wanted to know like what's the story of her adoption. Um, I loved like the movie Annie with Little Orphan Annie and my mm. mom's name is Anne. So I was like, my mom is basically Annie. Um, so I always wanted to solve that case. I wanted to solve my mom's adoption. And then as I was a teenager, that's when these sort of newer genealogy websites were popping up, like very early, like dial up internet times, but um, Roots Web and then which later became part of Ancestry.com started to come out. And I was researching, trying to figure out her, her mom's identity. Later, DNA testing came out, um, mid 2000s or mid 2010s, really. Um, and I did her DNA test so that I could f 
finally solve her her birth parents mystery and i had already figured it out with paper trail genealogy based on clues that her um in her mother's letters that she wrote her um but the dna gave some extra supporting evidence and i was able to figure out her birth father as well with the dna after that other adoptees ended up asking me for help because my mother had a couple of relatives that were adopted and um, this sort of applied DNA work is the same as what I do now. So that's one little passion. It started as a personal kind of endeavor to learn about yourself. And then yes. you just realized you had a knack for it. Yes. And, and I was really, and it was fun solving those mysteries. And then, uh, meanwhile, I also have always had an interest in true crime and John and Jane Doe cases. So mm. John and Jane Doe's are unidentified people. Um, there was a case that I was particularly interested in, um, the case of Lyle Stevick, and I used to spend a whole lot of time on Reddit um, oh, reading yeah, about that I've case. Been there before. <laughs> I hear Who hasn't been down a Reddit rabbit hole, right? So on Reddit, um, there was a, a subreddit for this specific case, and I was following that very closely. And the founders of my organization, DNA Doe Project, posted on there, and they were looking for new volunteers, um, people with experience in DNA genealogy for adoption. And of course I answered the call. Um, and I'm so lucky that I got in right at the start of the organization because um, I've been able to be with them almost from the very beginning. Mm. I got to lead that case. The first case that I ever worked on was the case that I had been down the Reddit rabbit hole of. Mm. And, um, and I'm super wow. proud of my work. Okay, so can you tell us a little bit about the different databases? Like, I would just love oh, a yeah. um, the CODIS, Gene Match, Family Tree DNA. Can you break down just where DNA is stored, what you have access to, what private companies have stuff that you don't have access to? Just give us a landscape of of what what's public and what's not and what's available. Yeah, so um, the traditional DNA database that is used is CODIS. So CODIS matches a couple of different things. It's used by law enforcement. It's not accessible by the public. And if a law enforcement officer finds a sample of DNA at a crime scene, they can enter that into CODIS. And then if that person has previously been arrested and has had a DNA sample taken at their last arrest or mm. conviction, then it will be matched to that so Does that person. happen when you go to jail? Do they swab you and then put you in a database? I think it depends on what state you live in and whether it's a felony or yeah. not it has but to be severe it's crime. a maybe or if you voluntary vo voluntarily give it oh gotcha and then there's also um endis n-d-i-s which is a dna index system which matches missing people against unidentified remains totally mm. said that they're when you're in one system you might not be in the other or they talk to each other right they don't talk to each other. So for, for example, if we had um, a John Doe and their mother has been arrested before, they're not necessarily going to match up because the John Doe is in Endis and then the uh, the mother is in CODIS in the offender database and they are not going to match them against each other. Oh, so is that just bureaucracy that's keeping I the two apart? Like, are they, I mean, I'm guessing these are owned by the federal government yes, or something and, like that or like the... Uh, well, there's also like state run databases too that are like sort of subsidiaries of things. Um, but yeah, it is it is a national database. But if you have a missing person, like if, if my son went missing mm -hmm. and then uh, unidentified remains are found and I've provided a DNA sample to match to any unidentified remains that are found as a missing person, then, then it would match. So oh, depending right. on what database the mom is in, uh, it may or may not be matched. So we've had that happen before where we had um, a John or Jane Doe that was found and it turns out that their their mom has been in prison before multiple times. And I thought to myself, like, how did we not solve this earlier? Because the match was in yeah. the database, but right. it was it's a different database. So, um, so there are those two. So those are the ones that the government uses. Mm -hmm. The public does not have access to them and those are traditionally used uh, for, for criminal reasons and to match missing people against John and Jane Doe's. What if and, like their relatives are not in the criminal database? So that's where we have these unidentified people. So if you have an unidentified person and they're, um, they have had their DNA entered into Endis, 
and there's no match. Um, and you know what? I should also mention they also enter them into CODIS because what if that person has been arrested before the, the actual unidentified remains person? <laughs> um, the DNA has to be in CODIS. And then if you don't have a match, then you still have this unidentified person. And that's when you might come to an investigative genetic genealogist mm. because there's a different type of DNA testing that can be done and a different type of uh, database that you can use. So those two, CODIS and ENDIS, are used for the government. And then the investigative genetic genealogist, we use a different type of DNA testing. Um, the type that's used traditionally with those traditional databases is called STR testing. And that looks at, from what I understand, a few dozen markers. It's the, the number of markers that they're looking at on the whole DNA profile, it's only a few of them, like a few dozen. And then SNP testing or SNP testing is a type that we do in investigative genetic genealogy. And that looks at hundreds of thousands of markers. So the main applied difference between those two types of testing is that with STR testing, you can tell the difference between really close relationships. So mm. you can match a mother to their child or a father to their child. You could uh, possibly match siblings or you could do a one-to-one, -one, like, a, like a person to their own DNA. Whereas with- If you have many more markers in two places, you can say there's a higher percentage of overlap and that's right. what allows you to- To measure yeah. more distant distances. <laughs> yeah, okay. So uh, if you have, if you're looking at hundreds of thousands of markers, um, you can look at how much, how many centimorgans that people share. Um, and that gives you relationship differences. So we can do DNA matching with third cousins, fourth cousins, fifth cousins, and so on, um, which gives us a lot more information from one DNA sample. The databases that we use in investigative genetic genealogy are called GEDmatch and Family Tree DNA. And these are the only two DNA databases that are allowed to be used for our type of work. GEDmatch is a publicly, it's like a crowdsourced DNA database. So people that have done a test at Ancestry mm -hmm. or 23andMe um, can upload their DNA into GEDmatch. Right. Oh, gotcha. Okay, so it's not like you passed a test with the police or something to go get access to those other two databases. You have two publicly crowdsourced ones that mm -hmm. you can get access to. That's right. And so, and anybody can put their DNA on there and anybody can access gotcha. it. So Matt, in a previous episode, Matt brought up his ancestry and I brought up my 23andMe, but we're not in there since we didn't manually go in right. and right. submit. But you should. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I was, oh, was so, going to say, like, you should submit it. to for, for, yeah. Why do you think that we should? Well. Yeah, why should we give up our yeah. DNA? First, I guess I should say that everybody should always read the terms and conditions of service for any website you're using, including your ancestry, your 23andMe, like mm. see what, what all are they using your DNA for? But... I think that people should be in GEDmatch <laughs> because that really helps us to solve cases. The more DNA matches that we have, the better it is for all of You've our cases. You've uploaded yours? Of course. That's what course. I. That's how I got started. Of course, yeah. And um, yeah, I was I was like an early adopter of GEDmatch, <laughs> and I have my um, I have all of my kits opted in for law enforcement matching, so anybody can see my DNA if they've uploaded a suspect case or. Um, or a John or Jane Doe. And I've never been told by any of my genetic genealogy friends that I have a match to any case. So mm -hmm. I'm sure that's coming one day. <laughs> <laughs> that's interesting. So, yeah. No. So you, so even if it doesn't feel like I know anybody that's committed a crime, I just, you just never know how it's all connected. And if having my DNA would tell somebody at law enforcement a little bit more information about where everyone else in the whole database is and where that person is. So it helps yes. them triangulate down. Yes. And it's funny that you mentioned, like, even though you don't know anybody that's done a crime in your family or, or anything like that, because we don't have any. I mean, I can name all my first cousins, I think. OK, um, do it. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Right now, go. <laughs> Ryan. No, Matt. that's fine. <laughs> just um, kidding. But I cannot really? name all my second cousins and I yeah, definitely cannot too... name all my third cousins. It's really, really hard. Once you get back, you're sharing second great grandparents with that per with your third cousins. That's pretty far back. 
And so when I, I occasionally I'll contact one of our DNA matches of our cases and I'll say, hey, we're working this case. Um, could you share some information about your family tree so that we can identify this person? And they're like, oh, I don't know who it is. There's nobody missing in my family. And and I kind of have to explain that, that, you know, this could there be your third be. cousin, it could be yeah. your fourth cousin, and they're, they might not be in your immediate family tree, but you you probably do have a missing person that's in your oh, family. Gotcha. So. Exactly. Okay, because when I'm thinking like, I don't know, it's like that's a myopic view when and we're all so connected. So what type of DNA do you use to solve cases? So primarily we use autosomal DNA, which is um, the DNA found on the, on the chromosomes. Um, you've got your 22 chromosomes and then you've got your parasex chromosomes. Mm -hmm. So um, those, those chromosomes contain most of your DNA and that's autosomal DNA. Yeah. And that's where we measure most of our, uh, most of the relationships, relationships that we're looking at between DNA matches. And that's also um, where we look for segments of shared DNA mostly. But then there's also some other DNA that we look at. And um, one of those types of DNA is mitochondrial DNA. Mitochondrial DNA is only passed from the mother to the child. And then it goes along the maternal line only. Um, so a son will always have the same mitochondrial haplogroup as their mother, mm -hmm. but will not pass on that to any children that they have. Because that's all in the organelle. So when it passes down, it doesn't ever get mixed up with anything correct. else. It only goes the maternal line only. So if I know that my mitochondrial DNA haplogroup is H, which I do, um, <laughs> then I know that my mother's 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 mother also has haplogroup H and any descendant from that same uh, from that same matri line, as, as we Fascinating. say. Fascinating. So in that case that I was telling you about where there were two consecutive generations of a uh, misattributed parentage event, um, we ended up using the mitochondrial DNA to figure out, um, it, it answered some questions in the family tree for us because we knew that whoever is the mother of this Jane Doe has to have the same mitochondrial DNA haplogroup. And so we were able to rule out certain lines of the family tree if, we, if, we, if there were DNA matches from those lines that had a different mitochondrial DNA haplogroup. So I've heard of mitochondrial Eve, and then you're saying that you're in this group H. How many, I mean, isn't most of the world connected with the same mitochondrial DNA, or how many types are there, and what parts of the world so, does it, do you actually end up with different mitochondrial DNA? Because it seems like that would be one chain for everybody. It, it, I mean, we, I guess we, we all share, like, one common maternal ancestor if you're going, like, millions of years back yeah. but then over times there are mutations and then oh the mutations those, are the branches right the mutations occurred you know some of them occurred a thousand years ago some of them might have occurred ten thousand years ago and so scientists much smarter than me are able to um tell how long ago that mutation occurred and then um but so when you say h it's a way to kind of group you into at least some larger group of right. people who share that Yes, because the mutations are going to be ancient. They're not going to be like very recent. Um, I mean, I guess you can't have a mutation. Yeah, at any but time, it doesn't. Not, but... It's not like mixing sexes each time. Right, right, and um, and generally, a region has a specific mitochondrial DNA haplogroup. So, in, in the United States, we're probably all very mixed. But um, if I see the mitochondrial DNA haplogroup B, that might be a person from Mexico as a Native American. If you went to like a Polynesian island or something, it might be right. a certain letter that represents that whole group. Exactly. And like H is very common. And I'm, I'm H. A lot of people in the United States are H. But sometimes that's one of the first clues that we get about a John yeah. or Jane Doe. Like I'm always wondering, like, what's that mitochondrial DNA? DNA? Is that like in a common ancestry? It is in, in 23andMe. It's not an ancestry DNA. Uh, yeah, okay. it's Sorry, Matt. Normal. You don't it's get to know yours. <laughs> Do you ever use Y DNA to solve cases? Yes, we do. Um, one other quick mito story, real quick. So one of my cases that I was telling you about earlier, uh, Patchy Junction Jane Doe. So she's the one that I was telling you about that is one quarter German, one quarter African American, and half Hispanic. And so we know that one of her parents is as um, half German and half African American, and then her other parent is Hispanic. I know that it's her mother that is Hispanic because her mitochondrial DNA haplogroup is a Native American haplogroup. So it does give us some helpful context clues. Y DNA is also 
sometimes helpful. Um, it also tells us regionally specific things. So we can say that this Y-DNA profile is most commonly associated with people from Poland. Um, and then if you have very good Y-DNA representation, um, again, it's all about representation in the database. Right. Um, if a lot of people with the same Y-DNA haplogroup have tested, then you might even be able to nail down a surname that should be associated with your John Doe because Y-DNA is passed down along the paternal line. Um, of course, we know that that can get messed up over time. Right, but at least it's a clue to follow. It's <laughs> it another thread for Detective Karen to go down and yes, it's figure like, this out. So if we have really, I have one case um, that I, I tried to do it in. Uh, it's a case of a man that is Polish or Czech, uh, he might be from from what is now known as Czechia. Um, so he's somewhere from those like kind of Slavic countries and he has very low representation in the databases. Again, his like top matches around 40 centimorgans, which is not going to get us very far with working the DNA matches. But I thought, well, let's at least check his Y DNA um, because maybe there's uh, maybe there's an answer there. Maybe we can get a surname. And if we have a surname, um, maybe this man has been, you know, arrested before or something like that right. in, in the region where he was found. Uh, so then uh, our lab expert checked with Family Tree DNA to see if we could match him to any other people's Y DNA in the database. And they there were there were no matches, so no close matches. So unfortunately, we weren't able to get an associated surname from him. What's a Santa Morgan? What does that represent? A Santa Morgan is a unit of shared DNA. So I think of it like centimeters almost because it's, 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 except the M is, it's a distance. Oh, it's, it's like a, a distance on, it's on like how many uh, nucleotides actually yes, fit. Actually, so it is a distance. It is. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's this. used to measure genetic linkage. So it tells us the, the right. relationship between two DNA samples. So um, but how many Santa Morgans is the whole th set? Uh, so a full match would be like around 3,500 Santa Morgans. And that would be parent child or or you to self uh it's like a full full match or full half match so full half match would be your parent because they match all of your dna on half of your uh on on one side of your chromosomes you know you have hair so um yeah that's cool yeah this is actually my cousin and i share about a thousand center morgans yes so oh, it says it right there i didn't even mm -hmm. notice that and there's uh, something called the Shared Centimorgan Project. You can put in any number there. Yeah, that one there. And you could put in like, like put in 44. And it'll highlight all the parts for you of like, it has a 37% probability to be any of those relationships or 24% probability to be any of those. So, and then it gives you the little chart below and it Ooh. highlights for you the ones that are applicable. <laughs> Cool, right? That's so interesting. <laughs> wow, that's that's awesome. And I use that all the time. I don't remember the other than thirty five hundred for a parent child. I don't remember all the numbers. So, what populations would you say are well represented in the database currently? I would say primarily Caucasian people, um, people of European descent. So not necessarily only people that are American, but um, we have really good representation of Canadians. Um, Many Irish and British, um, New Zealand and Australia are pretty well represented in the database. Um, I actually had an interesting case of a, of a Jane Doe who was descended from a British family, and she had very good matches, but most of them were in New Zealand and Australia, which was interesting because she was British, but a lot of people from Australia and New Zealand are of British descent as well. Yeah. Um, so that was an interesting one. And then pretty much everyone else is not well represented. So um, there is some representation of Mexican people in the database. And um, you also see a little bit of um, like our, our Asian cases are probably the most challenging. I would say that that's the least represented population, although I don't have exact numbers in front of me. But I just based on our casework, um, those are the ones that have the fewest and smallest matches. And then anywhere that's an extremely rural population. So we have um, one case that we suspect is probably somebody from Nicaragua, but it's very difficult to say because the matches are so low it could be just like it could be it's definitely like south america somewhere or central mm -hmm. america but um but we just can't say for sure because there's not enough dna matches to have us nail down a precise location 
<laughs> when you when you meet people, or is there parts of you that now like try to guess? <laughs> or you do know, a little breakdown or not? I definitely. I'm. Or do you sure try I to bet. turn that off? I bet. You used the word curious earlier. I say that I'm nosy <laughs> 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 or inquisitive. Maybe. Oh, we're inquisitive in this. Yeah, yes. inquisitive. Yeah, curious. Every, yeah, good. we're curious. Yes, um, yeah, because I immediately want to know. Like, have you done your genealogy? Like, what? What's your ethnicity breakdown? Have you done DNA tests? Um, are there any family secrets in your family that we need to uncover? And every year at Christmas time, I always um, post on my on my social media pages, "Hey guys, I know you're all getting DNA tests for Christmas. If you end up with a Go surprise, like, let me know." Because I think that those holiday DNA tests probably a lot of people get like a not too fun surprise when they take that test. Um, there's so many people that have so surprises many. in their family tree. There was, there's a celebrity that I feel like I look a lot alike, and I and I knew that her family's Irish. Oh, don't tell us, Matt. So. What do you think? <laughs> what celebrity does she look like? Who's Irish? Um, who's Irish? It's probably yeah. it's a true crime person, so you guys probably won't. What's know. her name? Let's um, go. Her let's name is up. also Karen. Her name is Karen oh, Kilgariff. Another Karen. Let's look yeah. her up. So. I think her oh. face looks a lot yeah. like mine. Dead yeah. ringer? Dead ringer. Not Maybe not dead ringer, but I definitely think there could be some... 80% match. Some DNA. I was looking for a combination. 90% match. Let's investigate. Yeah. 100% so match. Let's it's the same investigate. person. I like looked up her... I like built out her family tree to see if we're from the same region of Ireland. Um, and we're not. I was like so disappointed. I was like, oh, come on. <laughs> How long would you say it takes to build out a family tree? Not very long for me. Um, I mean, I just... I, I kind of... First, you got to find you got to find their parents. It's really hard yeah. to find close generations because most people don't have a lot of, you know, when people are 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 alive, there's not a lot of publicly available information. So when you go back to the 1940s and 1930s, you can look at census records, you can look mm. at the Social Security Death Index, you can look at their will that was on file from the 1800s. When you're when you're going back pretty far, there's a lot of resources, but if you're really close, then um, you have to look at obituaries that are published online, or you have to stalk their Facebook page and find out who their parents are that way. And then you got to look their parents up, or I use a newspaper database and um, look up old newspaper articles. Mm. And so it's harder to find stuff closer to right now. Yeah. But um, once you once you get back a couple generations, if the person is American, then it's usually pretty easy. There. So have you ever come across like family secrets when you build up and then build back down and then you notify Absolutely. people that like actually there's all this stuff that oh, they didn't no. expect i don't notify people about that but. Oh. <laughs> oh but you see it what have you discovered oh um, what types of, what kinds of things do you discover i guess well we yeah. see all the time all the time that that somebody's dad wasn't who they thought it was that's really probably Ooh. the most common thing yeah, and don't going be the back, one that tells them oh that. My gosh. <laughs> yeah, we say mama's baby, papa's maybe, because <laughs> um, you Have really you just don't know. <laughs> and um, <laughs> mama's baby, first. papa's maybe. <laughs> and there was a case that I did that I actually wrote up for a conference last year where there were two consecutive generations of that. Um, the Jane Doe, we found out that her her father listed on her birth certificate was not her father. And then also her grandfather listed on her birth certificate was not her grandfather. So we had to isolate only the matches from the maternal line to figure out who right. she was. So that was a really challenging one. And then I also have had two cases that um, adoption complicated the solve. So that's another big thing that impacts our ability to solve a case. Um, one of them is uh, Mallory Wetlands Jane Doe out of California. That's a big case that I'm going to be discussing at CrimeCon mm. because uh, we have solved it, in meaning we know who the Jane Doe's parents were. And 99% of the time, when we know who the parents are, we can find out who the child is. But in this case, the Jane Doe was um, most likely given up for adoption at birth. And so even though we know who the parents are, we're we're unable to completely solve. Wait, the so case. is there a third database of where babies go that can be like overlaid onto it, or is that become something that I doesn't wish. exist yet? Or okay, <laughs> um, not not yet. Our our law enforcement agent in that case has subpoenaed adoption records in three different states. There's a government database that keeps track of that stuff. It's not uh, the the government Just keeps track accessible. of overseas adoptions, and this was a domestic adoption, most likely, or maybe oh, but even that information like, might actually be truly erased. 
It might be. Yeah, because like adoption. in the state that in the state that it occurred in, uh, there was a lot of records that burned down after mm -hmm. after the time that this Jane Doe was likely born. The other thing is that we don't know which state she was born in because at the time then the time period that we're looking at, it was pretty common to if you were pregnant out of wedlock um, to go to a different state to deliver your baby and then go back to wherever you were living. So. We don't know what state it occurred in. We don't know exactly what year. We have a, a time period of like 1945 to 1955, but mm. we're not 100% sure. And then also there's like several different geographic locations involved because the Jane Doe was found in California, but we know that the mom lived in Missouri and the dad lived in Kansas. There's a lot There's a lot going on in that, in that case. Okay, so talk to mm. us about your relationship with law enforcement. Like where do they come into the picture and where do you come into the picture and when? Law enforcement, we're, we're a tool in the tool belt of law enforcement. So if I'm a law enforcement agent, then, um, and I have a John or Jane Doe case, um, I, it might be a cold case that this person's been unidentified for 20 years. Um, and I have their DNA and CODIS already. There were no matches. That's when I'm going to go to DNA Doe Project. So DNA Doe Project gets, um, they can go to our website. You know, um, the law enforcement agents can go to our website. They can put in a case submission form. And that's usually the way that they contact us at first. And they'll give us some information about their case and whether there's DNA available. Um, and then we shepherd them through the process of, of getting DNA if there's not. So is DNA Doe Project a nonprofit? Yes, we're a nonprofit organization. Um, all of our operations and all, um, and, it's 100% donor funded. Oh, yes. Um, so you said found, all, found, all women founders too, right? Yes. Yes. Our founders were uh, Margaret Press and Colleen Fitzpatrick. They founded it in 2017. And they also were the first organization, I should say, we, we were the first organization to make an identification of human remains using genetic genealogy. So pretty exciting. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that is cool. And uh, is there any other, like DNA Doe Project, is there other crowdsource groups or is it something that you all share information and come together are you pretty much the only name in the game if oh. law enforcement doesn't find uh we are not the only name in the game there's quite a few actually um, but they're all coming from those same two databases from the same databases yes yeah. so we all all um all investigative genetic genealogists use those those two databases what would you say are the different factors that impact cases getting solved I just want to give a little background. When I first started at DNA Doe Project, I remember thinking that we have to make sure that we have equal representation of like every race, every walk of life, um, that when we solve cases, we're solving them for everybody, not just the really like popular cases that everybody's following. And um, that was a great idea, but it wasn't as easy as I thought it would be because one of the biggest factors that impacts our ability to solve a case is the John or Jane Doe's ethnicity. And the reason for that is because of representation in the DNA databases. So um, for example, if I have uh, a case of a Caucasian John or Jane Doe, it's very likely that they're going to have excellent DNA matches and that we can solve their case in a number mm -hmm. of hours. Um, a good example of that, the John Wayne Gacy victim, Francis Wayne Alexander, his case was solved in eight hours. Um, another one that I did, uh, Lime Lady Jane Doe, was solved within 24 hours, I believe. Oh, so wow. those are really fast. And then I have other cases that I've been working on um, of populations that are less represented in the database, and they're taking forever to solve. So one of them, um, Broadway Street Phoenix Jane Doe, she is of Mexican descent from the Mexican state of Aguas Calientes. And... I've been working on her case for years and I've, uh, our volunteers have put in more than 380 hours in that case. Um, there's a case called Apache Junction Jane Doe. One of my earliest cases that I ever started, um, she was our 16th Jane Doe that we ever worked on. And uh, I've been working on her case since 2018 and it's still unsolved. She is one quarter German, one quarter African-American and half Mexican. So, really really difficult case very difficult matches to work and um that's one of the biggest factors that impacts our solve rate the one that goes on for a long time that means that the hours instead of searching the database are now being put into like reaching out to specific people asking them to, to upload in. data and trying to convince them to build out the database well sometimes um 
one thing that we spend a lot of time on, uh, well, when we get that DNA match list, what we do with those DNA matches is we build out their family trees. We build their family trees backward in time, and then we look for connections between them. And then this is the way that I always explain it. If you take my DNA and my first cousin DNA, use my cousin Matt. Take me, take <laughs> my cousin Matt. Okay. You can see that we share a certain amount of DNA, and that will tell you how close our relationship is. It'll say we're first cousins. So then you know that you're looking for a set of common grandparents. So you're going to build both of our family trees out, and you're going to put in our parents, and you're going to put in our grandparents, and you're going to see that we share a common set of grandparents. And then if you build back down, you can find all of the grandchildren that came from that union. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. Because you know oh, that those two yeah. DNA matches, like the reason why they match each other is because they share this common ancestor couple. So that's what we're looking for in all of the DNA matches of our does. We're looking for connections between their family trees that we have built backward in time. And then when we find the connection, which we call a common ancestor couple or most recent common ancestor, then we build forward in time. And then we're looking for a candidate that meets other criteria, like maybe they share other common ancestors that we've looked at, or maybe they move to a geographic location where this Jane Doe was found. So we're looking for, for that. Um, when you have a really underrepresented population, it is hard to find those common ancestor couples because there's just not that many DNA matches mm -hmm. that share um, that share the same family group. And then even if you do find them, if they're from a difficult population, right. maybe you're looking at overseas records or um, there's some other challenge in there. So they didn't like mail you a tooth or anything? No. You, they they <laughs> do the scan and then they just... So uh, the lab process is actually pretty interesting. Did you get it from any bone, right? Any bone. Yeah. The best DNA comes from blood. Um, so blood cards or vials of blood. And then um, next, uh, we can also do tissue. So um, there was one of our first John Doe's had a tissue sample available. And then uh, there's bone. Uh, teeth is better than bone because teeth has enamel. And uh, that protects the DNA inside. And then bones are not as great um, because the DNA is not always like in great condition inside of the bone. So in this case, we use bone. Um, but Sometimes when they've done CODIS DNA, they already have some DNA extract available, and sometimes they don't. And then we, uh, one of our partner labs has to extract the DNA, and then it has to go for sequencing, which is another part of the lab process, and then bioinformatics, which is where they put it all into a computer file so that we can get the DNA match list, and then we can finally do the genealogy after that. Gotcha. So they eventually say, all right, we're going to make this public and then they reach the reach out to you you basically get like a I guess an email or something with this information in it and then you start uploading it to your databases and doing your tracking right so in this case i think the first way that they identified victims was through their their things that they had on them so back in the 70s they were identifying some of these boys right away um, based on items that they had with them at the time they disappeared and things like that and then they probably identified some more uh, when codis came out and they were probably able to identify some of them with codis i haven't researched them 100 percent, but um and then ours is like the is sort of like the last tool in the tool bag um, where you can use investigative genetic genealogy. OK, so there was a case that came to you and it, it wasn't solved yet. And you were part of the solution? Yes. So um, myself and then I worked with two other team leaders on this case. And this was one Harmony. of our fastest solved. Who knows Harmony. about the New Deal? Harmony was one, yes. Right. Harmony, I love her. And um, and then Kevin Lord, who is also our director of lab and agency logistics. So the three of us were co-leading that case with a team of maybe three or four other genealogists. And um, and and it was solved within eight hours. You had wow. really good DNA matches in the oh, database. Oh, is that quick? Uh, I guess that because it was... Europeans? European, uh, European descent, well he's American. He was from the state of, uh, from one of the Carolinas. And um, and he had really good DNA matches. So uh, hey, well, I think you know, that the other cases probably have a, a good chance of getting world. solved, right? <laughs> yeah, I wonder how old they'd be now. Yeah, that's, so, mm -hmm. so when you actually solved it, and did you get to tell the family or? No, we or never anything, contact or... the family, okay. um, the law enforcement. The yes. Yeah. So we always give them and, and we never say that we've solved it either until um, uh, until they've had a one to one test. 
we never say that we've solved it. So we always give Just a get candidate. High probability. Yeah. So we always say we have a candidate for this John or Jane Doe. Um, we believe that it's this person. They were born at this time. Here's the proof of life search that we've done for this person. We can't find any evidence that they're living at this time. Um, if we have any information about like their life, then we'll kind of put a timeline together for them. And we also put a report together that has the list of DNA matches that we use to make this solve um, or to come up with this candidate rather and the supporting evidence that we've gathered. And then they take that information and they do more research. You can never use um, the, t the type of testing that we do with these more distant matches to say that this is 100% confirmation. They have to get a swab from either the parent or like a very close family member to identify the victim positively. I mean, I know working in the hospitals, you're probably constantly seeing the results of being good to people and like helping them. But this must be a great feeling too, just to be helping cl give closure to some of these families or some of these people who wonder. Yeah, um, it's bittersweet. Um, I, I think yeah, everybody, I everybody wants that. answers. That when you have like just an open wound of your missing loved one that has been gone for for so long, I'm sure that they are craving that answer and they want that answer. But the answer that we're giving them is never the one that they really wanted, which is that their loved one is deceased. One thing that I have learned over and over again, a lot of people ask us, um, this person was never reported missing there. And they'll, they'll say, you know, their parents were bad or something like that for not reporting them missing. But it hasn't always been easy to report people missing. They right. used to purge records every so often. So a person that went missing in the 80s, um, their missing persons report probably isn't in there anymore. They've got to re-report them. And all of the does that we've solved, they all had family members that were missing them. They all had family members that loved them. They all had family members that were they, looking for the them. The records are also just so spotty. Yeah, and and the records get lost over time. They didn't move them from uh, paper to digital. So it's not that the family wasn't looking. And so I hope that that's one myth that we can all dispel today, that just because there's no missing persons report doesn't mean that the family wasn't looking for them. They usually were. Are there any ethical concerns or dilemmas that come up in your line of work? Um, I would say there haven't been, I haven't had any personal ethical concerns yet. Um, but there are things that come up because this is such a new field that um, there are a lot of like moral gray areas. So one of those is that we, we have access to two databases, um, GenMatch and Family Tree DNA. The reason why we at DNA Doe Project only use those two databases is because those are the only databases whose terms of service allow us to use their databases. But if we, if if another organization decided that they want to use the other databases that we don't have access to against the terms of service of those databases, then could that hurt the whole field as a whole because not everybody's playing by the rules? So that's one concern that I have, and another ethical dilemma that comes up a lot is um, with baby doe cases. A lot of times there are John and Jane does that are infants that are found. And ultimately what will happen if those John and Jane does are identified is that their parent will probably be arrested um, depending on the circumstances yeah, of sure. the of the case. But and, that implies they had a baby and didn't... And, and didn't take care of it or... You know, or worse. Well, just like had a baby without the government even knowing because it wasn't in a hospital. Oh, I didn't even think about that. So, um, and and when it's a deceased baby, you know, that's a pretty serious crime. And a lot of people have complicated feelings about that because uh, what was that mother going through that caused her to make that choice at that time? Um, as a result of, of that, sort of ethical dilemma at DNA Doe Project, we don't do baby doe cases because those are, are likely to result in a conviction. And our mission at John at, at DNA Doe Project is to identify humans, not to convict criminals. Are you up on any of the breakthroughs that have happened with CRISPR or like gene editing? And I know that's pretty far mm -hmm. out there, but it's, you know, there's uh, in China, there was a, a baby that was born. It was genetically modified so that it couldn't have AIDS and um, that scientist went to jail for a few years, but it, it opens up a can of worms because like soon babies might be born with genetic changes made by choice. And that's right. going to throw the database off unless you keep track of who made the changes and why. Right. 
Well, and um, there's some studies going on with mitochondrial disease too, where potentially a baby could be born of three different individuals, a mother and a father, and then a third party, um, a third party's mitochondrial DNA because of oh, mitochondrial they were born disease. In, oh, yeah. Oh, oh. So, I was thinking like if they were born with a surrogate mother. Um, no, but you're saying because be of a disease. Okay. Because like of, of editing of the mitochondria uh, to eliminate a, a disease that's carried in the mitochondria. Yeah. So um, I've heard about yeah, that coming up. And, that. But, you know, I, I've, I have a friend that's, who, who had a relative that died from mitochondrial disease. And so, of course, like I want them to be able to have a baby and... Um, it's it's very tricky there's a lot of there's a lot of right gray areas yeah. right and um so i think that's why it's so important for us at dna doe project to stick to our mission um it's a human humanitarian mission it's uh identify john and jane does and um we're not getting too much into the weeds of all of the other things that could be on the horizon with this genetic genealogy well, there's a lot of search algorithms, too, that I imagine aren't completely applied to these databases. But with some of the breakthroughs in machine learning, there should be other ways to hone in on matches, too. So I could see some. I mean, what what does your your search bar look like? How do you navigate this thing? Well, what I get is a list of DNA matches in order of highest to lowest DNA match. So if if like if I looked at my DNA match list right now, it would say, you know, my top match is 137 centimorgans and the next one down is like 70 centimorgans. Right. So it looks pretty similar yeah. to these these yes, like 23 and me like interface Matt's, kind of uh, ancestry DNA. Um um so that's that's kind of what we start with and then uh, I use a lot of other accessory tools as well. I use something called DNA Painter, which gives me um, a painting Painter. of the. Oh, well, I imagine chromosomes. you're putting on like an Oculus and you're in three <laughs> dimensions, and there's people all around you. I wish it was fun. And you're like swiping through like monkeys to get to like hominids. That's what and, DNA Painter yeah. looks like. It looks like that that little uh, down below um, that one. That's what I use. So, yeah, it's oh, funny because that's, that's what like that that. All those colors? Those are the chromosomes. So on the left side, we have the list of chromosomes. It would say like 1 through 22, and then you'd have your X and your Y chromosome. Um, and so the numbers are the number of each chromosome. And then those little painted segments that are all different colors are a segment of DNA. So what I look for in a case, um, I love to look for a triangulated DNA match, which means that um, the two or more DNA matches share the same common segment of DNA. And when I find that, then I will find them in DNA Painter and I will color it in. And then I hope later on in the case that I can attribute that shared segment to a common ancestor. Because if I find two or more people that share that DNA segment and I see that they have the same ancestor, then I can attribute that DNA segment to that common ancestor. And I love that. It's very helpful in cases where there's a lot of endogamy, meaning people are related in multiple different ways. Um, if I can attribute specific DNA segments to a specific ancestor, then it tells us which ancestors come into play more than other ones because they're tied to the DNA. Yeah. Is there a, a, at any point in like a photo element or do you pretty much solve these things and pass them on and never actually get to see with your your eyes what the human faces look like? Oh, definitely. Um, we, we love pictures. We love pictures. When we identify a person, we spend hours after, when we found a candidate, we spend hours just looking for pictures of that person, That's looking for articles about their life. In, right? It's part of that. But then also in that nice report that we make for law enforcement at the end, we like to um, have a nice timeline there of, you know, when the last time that they were known to be alive is. Um, and we like to have as much information for law enforcement to run with as possible. So um, yearbook photos are great. Um, there was a case recently that uh, we found her social media. So um, with more, most of our cases are older than social media. So that's pretty uncommon. But um, sometimes we can find social media pictures and that's just a, a whole lot of images. And it's also super, super sad because when you know more about the person before they pass away, it creates such an element, like, you know, them, like, like you're and connected. Then, you, then you yeah. start feeling the actual Absolutely. sadness you do on a friend. 
Yeah, I'm sure you fill in the blanks of their story and what their life was like and yeah. Yeah. form your own attachments. Absolutely. And like and then and we also know all of their family members yeah. too. We've seen like their their if they have generational trauma, we've like looked at that in their in their family history. So Do you happen to have like any feel good stories or is it always like a dead body? Like do you have anything where someone wanted to just know their grandma or something i recently went on a family history trip with my mom and we went to go see the orphanage where she was born and um her first cousin was also given up for adoption in the same city same orphanage and he was the first adoptee case i ever worked on because he's a close dna oh, match to cool. my mother and so we got to meet them in real life my oh, mom met her cousin and that was circle. really cool yes um, so we were all in Virginia, we had lunch together and it was just really neat to have that positive connection happen. And it all was because That's of DNA. Cool. Yeah. Cause I always see like when like twins have like separated, separated at birth, birth, they come together yeah. and they're like, oh my gosh, you blink during movies like I do or yeah. whatever. And it's like all these like <laughs> you little have here things. Too? It's amazing how many uh, things people can have in common. My mom, one of her things with her cousin was that they both um, started to go gray. Their hair turned gray at like 27. And so that's what they the kept DNA. on talking about. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming and chatting with us. This was really fascinating. It's uh, just amazing to think that we have so much information like flowing into our in our blood and in our bones and that we're now starting to use technology to connect us all together. And yeah. That's cool. Absolutely. Thank, Thank you, you so for much. having me. Thank you so yeah, much. Yeah, very exciting. You.